Hello, my name is Lynn Hilton Wilson, and I'm here to talk to you about some of the hard questions in church history. And it's not just in church history, it's in our own lives as well for today's topic, because it has to do with the gifts of the Spirit. I'm sure I'm not alone in asking, why can't my prayers be answered right now? And why can't this healing occur? And why can't I have the gift of charity? And how do I make my faith stronger, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But the gifts of the Spirit were really a hot topic in the Second Great Awakening. So as we look at section 46, and it actually trails on to next week's Come Follow Me as well in section 50 and prior to section 46 with Sister Hubble or Mrs. Hubble. So there's lots of different challenges as the church grows to dealing with how to interpret the Spirit. I don't know if you remember, but back when we talked about the first sections of the Doctrine and Covenants, I referred to the sections 5, 6, 8, 9, um, 11 as a handbook of revelation that the Lord was teaching Joseph and Oliver what is revelation from the Spirit of God and what is not. And I see that same thing that was taught to, there was needed now with the early saints in Kirtland. So let's go back in time to 1830 and 1831 and 1832 to the Kirtland era. Actually, I think today I do cover all the way th through um, the time of the early 1840s because I want to just give an overarching expanse of how the gifts of the Spirit were implemented in Joseph's life. These are some of the hard questions that I've heard. They may not be your hard questions, but I still believe very strongly that if we approach all of our hard questions like Joseph did, with faith and meekness, trusting in God's answer, trusting that he sees more than we do, we will find peace even in the midst of turbulent times. Number one, does Joseph simply teach the same spiritual practices of the spiritual Pentecostals around him? That was a charge that is still attacked against Joseph regularly. He's a product of his environment. He's teaching the same Pentecostal activities that were already there in the Second Great Awakening. Why don't we have better documentation for the gifts of the Spirit or for the times that the Spirit occurs in our life? Will all priesthood blessings be fulfilled? And why doesn't God answer every request of healing? Please come up with your own. I hope that this session is always stimulating more questions because it's the questions that seek us to study and it's the study that takes us to our knees and humbles us and then we can receive answers from the Lord. Let's look chronologically back again. I mentioned many times that the Second Great Awakening starting in about 1801 at the Cane Ridge, Kentucky with um, Barton Stone lasts up until the end of the 30s, 1830s, and some people get claim at 1840-41, but it's sort of petering out by that time. Joseph, of course, came from a family where the spiritual gifts were very manifest. Joseph's born in 1805 up in Vermont. His mother has already had very significant spiritual experiences where she commits herself to the Lord, if and she is brought back to life. One of her daughters, um, her his dad, before the time of his of Joseph's first vision, has seven visions of his own or dreams that are divinely directing him to keep seeking for more truth. And I put 1805 to 1827 just because that's when Joseph leaves the home. And so that was the most saturated time that he's there. And he goes back with his wife and several other times, you know, for periods. But that period from 1805 to 1827, he was there consistently. April 1830, of course, we have the first miracle of the church shortly after the organization of the church, where Joseph casts a devil out of Newell Knight. In November of that same year, the missionaries are able to offer the gift of the Holy Ghost to the converts in Kirtland, and it is unfortunately misunderstood by a few of them, and we'll talk more about all these details. In December of that year is when the missionaries leave and more and more counterfeit spirits arrive. By February of 1831, when Joseph and Emma arrive, following the commandments given in section 37 and 38, they see firsthand some of these counterfeit spirits intermingling with the gifts of the Spirit that are outlined in 1 Corinthians by Paul. On February 9th is when the Lord revealed the law of consecration that we talked about last week. And later in February is when a investigator, Mrs. Hubble, claims to prophesy and she wants to teach the new church. And the Lord gives her instructions in section 43. 
in March of that year, the Lord reveals the purpose of the boundaries of the gifts of the Spirit. And that is where we're going to focus today on section 46, one of my favorite sections in the Doctrine and Covenants, and it's so applicable to our time. And there are many, many, many questions that we'll talk about in addition to mine that I hope answer some of your questions. Then I'm going to jump ahead a little bit to 1836 at the dedication of the Kirtland Temple, which was known as a week of a spiritual Pentecost, July 22nd of 1839 with the Day of Healing. Also, by November of 39, Joseph identifies the gift of the Holy Ghost as the major difference of our church and others to President Martin Van Buren. I've already clobbered this topic so many times. I just want to briefly remind you that all around Joseph and all around Kirtland, Ohio area are revivals. Um, Sidney himself gave several camp meetings and revivals in the area within 20, 30, 40 miles of Cleveland up there in that um, western Connecticut Western Reserve in northeastern Ohio. As the Methodists grew in um, numbers as the American citizens moved west, more and more experimentation was allowed. Because in the Puritans, remember their thought was that you wait patiently for the Spirit to move you, but the Methodists and many others, um, depending on the minister, had feelings um, that were very different and that you needed to seek these things and that all manifestations of an extraordinary uh, behavior were probably from the Lord. And that was the challenge. But Joseph, in this area of the Spirit, manifestation really is different than his environment. He makes an abrupt and radical departure, actually, from his environment. And although we're still talking about the gifts of tongues in both camps, he then, he says it has to be done the Lord's way, with the Lord's authority, in and often in a calm, quiet, peaceful environment where the Spirit is in charge. I think the main challenge in our culture at that time was the, the lack of the gift of discernment. And that's why there was so much contention between the different religious parties on the subject of the Spirit, which was sometimes called the Spirit of Revelation. So it goes back to what I said were the three major topics of the 19th century in across the United States in their literature and in their sermons. Um, the depravity of man, the Trinity, and number one, revelation or the working of the Spirit. As we look at 1 Corinthians, we have a wonderful view, and I feel like Joseph knew these gifts of the Spirit, and many, many, many Americans knew these gifts of the Spirit and spoke about them. And I find that um, even now we have a very diverse interest in Christian religions now across the nation in the gifts of the Spirit, depending on where you live and your community. But along this spectrum, at the time of Joseph Smith, some people believed, um, and I'm thinking specifically of a few Methodists, as well as a few um, Reformed Baptists, as well as, anyway, I don't need to go into details, but barking and jerking and fainting and screaming were all gifts of the Spirit in their book. And then on the other extreme, there were just the gifts and the the gifts of the Spirit that they called enthusiastic were not from God. The only gifts of the Spirit that were from God were more of the fruits of the Spirit, peace and joy and love. In fact, um, many times people would say, well, I haven't felt the Spirit. And that's it. Have you felt peace? Then you felt the Spirit. Have you felt love? That, what we usually refer to as the fruits of the Spirit. So you have this dichotomy between the Reformed traditions and the Methodists or any other people who are experimenting with it. But in our first lecture of this series, I quoted a lot of, of people who said that the screams could be heard from a mile away and that it sounded like the roar of Niagara when people got worked up. And I also quoted earlier the reaction to these jerks that they couldn't be stopped unless you began to pray. And this was really an issue in the area where the saints were going to be gathering now in Kirtland area or the Cleveland area. And that's why I brought it up again. In order for you to see the contrast, though, between what Joseph restored and what was already there, I feel it's very helpful to actually see what the other um, rest of Americans were saying. So I've 
chosen four or five or six or seven, actually, I think, uh, different perspectives on w- how they viewed the workings of the Spirit, the gifts of the Spirit. And the first one I chose was the largest um, denom- the largest faith ideas in the early Americana. So from the time of the Pilgrims, 1620, up until the 1800, the Reformed traditions. And so you have as I mentioned before, the Presbyterians and the most Congregationalists, many Baptists, some Lutherans, uh, the Dutch Reform, you know, there are a group that are bound to the Westminster Confession as their creed, and they are bound to Calvinistic thought. And Joseph and Emma's ancestors came from this. Joseph's own mother was a devout Presbyterian, and we know that Hiram and um, some of his sisters also joined her in that worship and in that I, that idea. But the number one spokesman for this idea in at the time of Joseph Smith was President Charles Hodge, who was president of Princeton University, and Princeton was sort of the stronghold of the um, the foundational ideas that were to be perpetuated from the Reformed tradition, and he is a voracious writer, and we have volumes and volumes of his thought, and they perpetu- they just infiltrated all of the United States. The best place to go to school for your divinity um, education in the Reformed tradition was here at Princeton, and he was your professor, or his textbooks were your professors. He refers to modern prelates, meaning modern ministers or modern preachers. Modern prelates claim no immediate commission, no independent knowledge derived from immediate revelation. So he's saying none of us have had any revelation that is divine. No personal infallibility. We're not infallible, so we don't have anyone who has the capability of recording any revelation as if it were divinely given. No visions of Christ and no gift of miracles. So that is the stronghold of the greatest faith in uh, the first two centuries of American history. He continues on. A man cannot be a prophet without the gift of prophecy, or a miracle worker without the gift of miracles, or have the gift of tongues without the ability to speak another language than his own. No man can rightly claim to be an apostle without possessing the gifts which made the original apostles what they were. And what he's trying to say is, none of these things exist. We don't have prophets. We don't have apostles. And yet, he doesn't realize that at the same time he's writing this, Joseph Smith is speaking in tongues is writing scripture, is ordaining apostles under the same priesthood that Peter, James, and John um, administered the keys to Joseph. You know, it's just so ironic that um, this is what's coming out of his pen um, in the 1830s as Joseph is practicing these things. Um, I've often wondered if it was an attack against Joseph because I think I told you already by 1830, New York and the East Coast states are already publishing information on the Golden Bible and the Mormonites, and I I presume that President Hodge knew about some of them. But I don't know. I can't can't pinpoint that one. We've talked a lot about Alexander Campbell when we talked about the move to of the four missionaries coming to the area of Northeastern Ohio. His view on the spirit of gifts of the spirit was the Holy Spirit was communicated by the apostles' hands. Consequently, when the apostles all died, these gifts were no longer conferred. Those gifts have ceased, and the Holy Spirit now operates upon the mind of men only by the word, meaning only by scripture, um, sola scriptura. I just find this information so ironic because he knew Joseph claimed to be a prophet. He had read the Book of Mormon. He had studied it. Um, Unfortunately, he asked his hard questions without an open heart, without faith, without humility, and he came to the wrong conclusion. And I hope, as we ask ours, we do not follow the footsteps of Alexander Campbell. (laughs) And um, because Joseph did receive the apostolic priesthood from the hands of Peter, James, and John. And um, so did Oliver. We have a second witness. And then We have the witness of all those who have received it and had a witness in our dispensation. I wanted to just remind you of how many people in the early church had been Campbellites. Phoebe and Sidney Rigdon, Parley and Thankful Pratt, Julia and John Murdoch, Elizabeth and Newell Whitney, Marinda and Orson Hyde, Harriet and Lyman White, um, 
Lydia and Edward Partridge and Frederick G. Williams. I couldn't find his wife. I don't know if he wasn't married when he was a Campbellite or not. But um, many, 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 and as we mentioned before, over half of his congregation in the Kirtland area, between the Mentor and Kirtland um, congregations, joined the restored Church of Jesus Christ, or Church of Christ, under the direction of Joseph Smith. By 1850, though, the largest church in the United States is Methodist, and they were gaining all during Joseph's lifetime in the western frontier in the upstate New York. And of course, we know that Joseph and Emma were both partial to Methodist thought. Here is Peter Cartwright describing what happened one time when he met Joseph Smith. Now, Joseph never acknowledges this conversation. It's not in any of his writings. But I did find that it could have happened because Peter Cartwright was an itinerant preacher and he had jurisdiction over an area where Joseph was once. When Joseph was taken to court, Cartwright could have had an interaction with him then. Here he is, Peter Cartwright. On a certain occasion, I fell in with Joe Smith. Upon the whole, he was pretty well for clumsy Joe. Now, he said, if you will come with me to Nauvoo, I will show you many living witnesses that will testify that they were by the saints cured of blindness, lameness, deafness, dumbness, and all the diseases that human flesh is heir to. And I will show you, said he, that we have the gift of tongues and can speak in unknown languages and that the saints may drink of any deadly poison and will not hurt them. I should have told you, they've had a long conversation before, according to Cartwright, that's all written out about the scriptures and about the restoration. And then this is the concluding, according to Brother Cartwright, that Joseph is inviting him to Nauvoo. And even if he exaggerates part of it, there may have been some strain of truth to this conversation. I, I don't know. Yes, said I, Uncle Joe, but my Bible tells me the bloody and deceitful man shall not live out half his days. And I expect the Lord will send the devil after you some of these days and take you out of the way. They never met in Nauvoo, unfortunately. Brother Peter Cartwright did not make that journey. But, oh, did he have a lot to say about Joseph in his autobiography and about the saints. And one of those experiences that he refers to, I think we'll talk about later in Kirtland. Charles Finney is one of my favorites. Um, he's a Congregationalist, although he was um, educated in the Reformed traditions. He chose not to follow their teachings and chose to follow what he felt was revelation. He says that he had a vision of the Savior. When I've read that account, I believe he did. Um, he also was a man of great prayer and was what it often is referred to as the father of revivalism. Quote, we need the light of the Holy Spirit to teach us the character of God, the nature of his government, the purity of his law, the necessity and fact of atonement, to teach us our need of Christ in all his offices and relations and governmental and spiritual and mixed. We need the revelation of Christ to our souls in such power as to induce in us the appropriating faith. So he sees a link between the spirit and faith and that we've got to seek for it and search. And I love his stories of his prayer meetings where everyone in the room will pray until they feel the spirit of the Lord. And I try to follow his example on that one. We mentioned before a little bit about a group called the Shakers when we talked about their leader, Mother Anne Lee, who claimed to be Jesus Christ as a female form in the last days. As we remember, their correct name, instead of being Quaking Shakers, is the United Society of Believers in Christ's Second Appearing. And there's a very millennialist view in their thoughts. We have an author referring to some of the unusual behaviors. On the subject of jerks, I have seen the person stand in one place and jerk backward and forward in quick succession. I've inquired of those thus affected and they could not account for it. But some have told me that those were among the happiest seasons of their lives. We would call that possessed by the devil, but they did not. Barton Stone, this is the man I mentioned was the preacher at the first 1801 Cane Ridge, Kentucky, enormous. 20,000 people were the nearest town had 2,000. The nearest city had 2,000. It was miles away. 20,000 people meeting here in Cambridge, Kentucky for days and days on end. And Barton Stone was one of the major preachers there. He did start his own religion in the first decade of the 1800s, um, but he still joined into an liaison with the Reformed Baptists. Okay, quote, the study of the Holy Scriptures with fervent prayer and obtain license from God to preach the simple gospel with the Holy Ghost set down from heaven, without any mixture of philosophy or vain deceit, traditions of men or the rudiments of the world, 
the apostles were forbidden to leave Jerusalem and preach the gospel until they had received the Holy Spirit of promise and endued with power from on high. Even deacons who were to attend solely to the temporalities of the church must be filled with the Holy Ghost as a qualification of their office. The Lord will have no servants in his church without this qualification, without the Spirit. How can we minister to others? He is a fan of seeking the Spirit and being God's servants through it, whether it is from the Holy Scriptures or fervent prayer, but he really believed in it. And so did Joseph Smith in a different avenue. You can see, though, why people see Joseph as a product of his environment. He he fits into some of the things that they're talking about. But as we read the differences between the gifts of the Spirit in each of the standard works, 1 Corinthians, sections 46, Moroni 10, and the seventh article of faith, we begin to see the innuendos that show Joseph's genius or the Lord's intervention in this aspect of the actions of the Spirit. I should have also mentioned that some people call Joseph a transcendentalist, that instead of fitting into the more um, logical ideas of the um, Enlightenment era, Joseph is more of a romantic or a transcendentalist, is what is claimed by some American religious historians. And I personally love Ralph Ralph Waldo Emerson's statements on things like Revelation. Here he says, Show us that God is, not was, that he speaketh, not spake. And another favorite is Elizabeth Browning, Barrett Browning. And she has that long, beautiful poem, Aurelie, which the center point reads, or a portion of it reads, Earth is crammed with heaven, and every common bush a fire with God, but only he who sees takes off his shoes, the rest sit around and pluck blackberries. You know, they see God all around them. And I believe that Joseph did too. I'm sorry I didn't get some Native American thoughts in here because we would have found that as well. But as the four, the four missionaries leave the um, Cleveland general area, we are blessed to have an inside view on how the gifts of the Spirit were working there by people's journals and um, Joseph's writings after he arrived. But even before they get to Kirtland, Joseph refers to something that happens. The first miracle in the church is how Joseph records it in Coldsville, New York. And you know, remember that these wonderful saints um, traveled the almost 90 miles up to Fayette to attend the organization of the church. And Joseph Knight um, Sr. was the one who Joseph and Emma used his wagon um, without asking permission to go get the golden plates. You know, he'd come up to visit the family in Manchester, Palmyra, then uh, September 20th. I think he arrived two days earlier or something the night that Joseph was um, going out to get the plates. He used his van. And also he's the one who gave supplies during the translation to Oliver. So the Knights have been a wonderful support. And I just have to say one more thing about this wonderful family. They never leave. They are always committed. And they came with great faith and great commitment to the doors of the Restoration. But their son, Newell Knight, had not yet been baptized after the organization of the church. And as Joseph is going back down to visit, uh, to be with his wife in Harmony, who does not come up for the, um, I don't know if you remember this, but Emma is not there. She is down at home in Harmony, taking care of everything. And as Joseph comes down, he stops off to visit the Coldsville saints. And he meets with them, and he asks Newell to pray. And um, the young man hasn't been baptized yet. He says, Joseph, I don't, I don't really feel comfortable doing this right now, but I promise I'll pray tomorrow with you. And the next day that they gather together, um, he still is not feeling like he'd like to pray aloud in public And this was not part of his culture. And as a result, um, he he denied, he asked Joseph if he can please just pray on his own. But that unfortunately opened the doorway. He, He told the prophet he would obey and then he did not. And it opened the doorway for a satanic influence in his life. And he comes home intending to pray privately and his tongue is bound and his body is possessed and 
with the devil and he is thrashed around and he begs his wife to go call Joseph. And when Joseph comes in the room, there are others gathered. It says eight or nine by this time. And Joseph is able to finally grab him by the arm and asks um, what he can do. And Newell asks Joseph to cast out the devil. And he says, I know you can do it. And Joseph says in his account that almost instantaneously without thought, he rebuked the devil in the name of Jesus Christ and the devil departed. And then Newell said he saw the devil leave his body and he was weak and limp and they laid him down on a bed. And um, I don't know if Joseph left then, but the next part of the account is from Newell's journal himself. And he said, He's been laying on, the, on this couch or this day bed in, in their home. I felt myself attracted upward and remained for some time enwrapped in contemplation, insomuch that I knew not what was going on in the room, and then pressing on my shoulder and the side of my head, which served to recall me to my sense of my situation. And I found that the Spirit of the Lord had actually caught me up off the floor and that my shoulder and head were pressing upon the beams. I assume he means the beams of the roof or the ceiling. Most people from my generation would say this is not the church that they joined. (laughs) This is not the way that things are practiced now. And yet I have to say It was their generation. And Joseph says this is the first miracle. And when the devil is cast out, this visionary experience that he has transported him. And I believe that it did occur, even though it isn't very common to us to ever see anything like this now. However, we do know that devils still have a major control, if not the same as the 19th century, even more than the 19th century, but the devil uses different means. And yet, Sometimes it is still in this manifestation. Um, My husband has seen it, and members of my graduate school class have described things like this, even though I have never seen it myself. So I do know that the devil still uses his old tricks, even as he's learning more new ones. But this miracle healed Brother Newell Knight and gave him an even stronger desire to follow the prophet with exactness. John Coral was an investigator in upstate Ohio, and for six weeks he'd been investigating the church, and he said, I attended several meetings, and he's sort of going as a devil's advocate. You know, he wants to find fault, and the meeting he's describing now is a testimony meeting, and it lasts all through the night. I cannot imagine how wonderful that would be. I'm not a night owl, but to be able to have a meeting as long as you want instead of having to stop on the hour and allowing everyone there to experience the gifts of revelation and prophecy would just be amazing. And he said, I attended several meetings. I watched closely and examined carefully every movement of the meeting. And after exhausting all my powers to find the deception, I was obliged to acknowledge in my own mind that the meeting had been inspired by some supernatural agency. He goes on and says many improprieties and visionary notions. So he joins the church for a brief time. And in this Kirtland area, before Joseph arrived, so the missionaries, remember, leave in late November, and Joseph sent John Whitmer in to help, but John doesn't come immediately, and Joseph doesn't come until February 1st, and John doesn't have the ability to go around and meet everybody's needs and attend all the different house churches that are going on. And so John Coral is describing what has happened in a small subset of these early saints before Joseph arrives. Many improprieties and visionary notions crept into the church, which tried the feelings of the more sound-minded. And then he describes the people that are having these experiences as young ones. They saw wonderful lights in the air and on the ground, and they would relate many great and marvelous things that they saw in their visions. They conducted themselves in a strange manner, sometimes imitating Indians, but very few of the church were exercised in, this, in that way. I also have another account of somebody else who says that there was somebody, um, Brother Hancock, Levi Hancock, described somebody acting like a baboon. Another account, they stood on stumps where they were felling trees and would be so enwrapped in a vision they wouldn't know what was going on around them. And they would be preaching and, and acting things out, but completely oblivious to the rest of the world. And Joseph teaches that these were 
deceiving spirits, that these are false spirits into the church and that they needed to avoid them. But Parley P, as you know, was one of the missionaries that helped convert many of these first hundred, which then planted the seeds for the second hundred and the third hundred and the thousand. He comes back from the Lamanite, from the mission to the Lamanites from Missouri and stops off in Kirtland waiting for his wife. And he is called and starts serving in other little branches outlined in the area. And he recorded in his journal, as I went forth among the different branches, some very strange spiritual operations were manifested, which were disgusting rather than edifying. Some persons would seem to swoon away and make unseemly gestures and be drawn or disfigured into their countenances. Others would fall into ecstasies and be drawn into contortions and cramps and fits. And others would seem to have visions and revelations which were not edifying and which were not congenial to the doctrine of the spirit of the gospel. In short, a false and lying spirit seemed to be creeping into the church. So Parley goes and asks Joseph to inquire of the Lord concerning these spirits or manifestations. And after we had joined in prayer in his translating room, he, Joseph, dictated in our presence the following revelation. And that is the background to section 46. And I am again so grateful that there are Party P. Pratt's among the church now who will see a challenge that is not quite right and go to the people that need to be told and try to rectify it. We do not need to endure things that are inappropriate. We need to support our leaders and move ahead. But Parley knew that this was not right. And he acted and, again, by small and simple things, proceeded that which is great. One more observation before we jump into the section of 46. This is in the Painesville Telegraph. Quote, most wild, frantic, and horrible fanaticism. Indian modes of warfare, such as knocking down and scalping, you know, so we have all sorts of challenges. So on May 8th, 1831, Joseph receives this wonderful revelation, and he acknowledged in his history that some strange notions and false spirits had crept in among them. And I would just like to remind all of us, and myself especially, that wherever there is a truth, there will be a counterfeit. And Satan has been counterfeiting since the Garden of Eden. He takes the place of the Lord and tries to provide the fruit himself. And doing it just like he counterfeited our Savior in on the temptations. He tries to take God's timing and puts it into his timing. Do it now, do it my way. And unfortunately, the door is open in our generation for far more um, satanic influences than it was then, even though now there's a little more subtlety. John Murdoch, I had mentioned, was a fabulous missionary. And he, as he is serving a mission to the Cleveland he realizes that there is great persecution coming um, because of some of these unusual events in some of our meetings. So when he comes back to talk to Joseph, he also expresses this need. So we've got Parley, we've got John Murdoch, we've got Joseph himself seeing it, and I hope John Whitmer was aware as well. And these deceiving spirits are not only addressed in section 50 or 46, but also in section 50. I mentioned 43 earlier. So it was not just a one-time deal. It happened over several weeks and months, and it needed to be cleansed, and it was a confusing thing. But you have to remember that these people have barely been baptized. I keep reminding myself, I just was on the baptism via Zoom um, last week, and, you know, this new convert knows so little about the gospel of Jesus Christ. They have faith, and they're baptized, but I see these early saints in the same position. They know so little about it yet. Even though they have made the commitment to learn more, the devil is trying to regain them. And the adversary, of, according to Lehi, there's opposition in all things. The adversary is working very strongly. So Joseph was inspired by the Lord in section 46, quote, that ye may not be seduced by evil spirits or doctrines or devils or the commandments of men. Beware, lest ye are deceived. And that ye may not be deceived, seek ye earnestly the best gifts, always remembering for what they are given. They are given for the benefit of those who love me and keep my commandments. And him that seeketh to do so, that all may be benefited, that ask and not for a sign. And the problem was, in order to join one of the many, many congregations or many of the faith denominations in the early 19th century, one had to express a spiritual experience. Whether you were a Presbyterian or a Methodist and everything in between, in order to receive baptism, you had to say, this is what happened to me. This was my spiritual experience, and now I am ready to convert. 
or to have the ordinance of baptism or the sacrament of baptism performed or to be a member of the church or whatever. And Joseph was taught very clearly that when God gives these gifts, it is in an orderly fashion and it is for the profit of others. Five times in section 46, clearly, and seven times if you just look at the innuendos, the Lord repeated to Joseph, these gifts of the Spirit are only given to bless and benefit others. And I have to tell you one funny story. I was um, teaching institute in one of the Stanford wards in California, and um, I started out the class by saying, which gift of the Spirit would you like? Say your name and which gift of the Spirit you're seeking for right now. And so many of those wonderful Stanford students said the gift of knowledge, the gift of wisdom. And um, I assume that they were asking for them in order to bless other people, not just to get good grades. But Joseph very clearly stated in section 46 that when we are seeking a gift of the Spirit, it's not for our own aggrandizement and our own benefit. It has to be as a benefit for to build the kingdom or to bless our neighbors. That's when the gifts of the Spirit are given. And I'm fascinated by the fact that Joseph could not call on them whenever he asked. He had to wait on the Lord's timing and wait until it was the will of the Lord. And then he was. I just read part of this verse, but can you answer it already? Who receives the gifts of the Spirit? Those who keep all my commandments or are trying to, it said. We have these gifts so that we won't be deceived. And we have them when we ask in the Spirit. We have to know that we're asking the right thing. I often say, may I pray for this? I often ask the Lord, may I pray for this child in this way? May I ask for the gift of healing here? Or should I ask that they have an experience to help them endure? You know, it's, it's really a beautiful. But the bottom line is the gifts of the Spirit are to bless others. So we've got all four standard works with the gifts of the Spirit. And in my handout, I have them listed in three different charts. So you can look at it just briefly or you can go in depth. And section 46 is almost twice as long as Moroni and 1 Corinthians. Of course, the article of faith number seven is the shortest. But in section 46, Joseph introduces four ways that we can exercise our faith that are different than in the others, which I just love. We can have faith to know that our Savior is our Redeemer by feeling his cleansing power in our life and receiving that witness that our sins have been forgiven prior to partaking of the sacrament or baptism, or just prior to going to bed. He also has that we can believe, have faith to believe on others' testimonies. We have faith to be healed and faith to heal. And these four ways of exercising faith are unique, but there are other things in section 46 that are unique as well. Joseph is told that he has, is the head, but in 46, you see, he does not mention faith I mean, he mentions faith four times, but he doesn't mention hope or charity, which is quite surprising to me. And I don't know why. I've studied it for years. That's a question that's still simmering on the back burner. The only thing I can come up with is Joseph felt those were attributes that we need to inculcate rather than the Savior bestowing upon us, that we can develop charity if we follow the rules. They're not rules, but the guidelines that are given in Moroni and in 1 Corinthians 13 where we're told that we have to be humble and meek and not puffed up. And when we go about that whole list and use it as a guidebook, I feel like we can learn line upon line how to have this Savior's love in our lives. But that's one of my hard questions. By the time Joseph receives this revelation in March of 1831, he has experienced all the gifts of the Spirit that are listed in section 46 except for one. And I have three or four examples in our last couple of minutes to share with you, depending on how much we have, of his experience with some of those gifts. The first one that I want to talk about is when he received or heard the gift of tongues appropriately. So even though the newspaper was saying lots of people are speaking in other languages, Joseph hadn't heard it. And he had not interpreted tongues nor spoken in tongues until he met Brigham Young for the first time. And Brigham and his brother, Joseph Young, and myself, meaning Heber C. Kimball, Heber's the author here, excuse me, arrive in Kirtland. Remember, Brigham had been investigating the church for a couple of years. He was in upstate New York and also had lived in Vermont as well. And when Heber and the Youngs saw Joseph Smith, they had a glorious time during which Brother Brigham spoke in tongues. 
this being the first time Joseph had heard the gift. And the prophet rose up and testified that it was from God, and the gift fell upon him, and he spoke in tongues. I think that is amazing that when we acknowledge something, our faith grows stronger. When we acknowledge God's hand in our life, it helps us. You know, I always look for the miracles of God sprinkled around us every day, like the dew in the morning. I just keep my eyes focused on where the Lord is performing his tender mercies. One of my wonderful comrades calls it God sightings. I don't know what faith he was when he came up with that name. He since has joined our church, but at the time, I just love that. Oh, there's a God sighting, and you can see God's hand in your life. On June 15, 1842, though, Joseph did give a word of caution on speaking in tongues and encouraged us to use it as missionaries, not necessarily otherwise, especially when there is not an interpreter present. Be not so curious about tongues. Do not speak in tongues except there be an interpreter present, and the ultimate design of the tongue is to speak to foreigners. But when they are applied to that which God does not intend, they prove an injury and a snare and a curse against the blessing. Um, Many times Satan has counterfeited that, and it has not been good. But um, within the decade of this section, Joseph and many, many, many saints who have been cast out of Missouri and spent a cold winter in their tents and in the um, kindness of the Quincy neighbors' homes, and then come up um, in such a compromised state to the area of Commerce, Illinois, and then are inundated with malaria. It was just hardship after hardship after hardship. It just makes me laugh when I think of the difference between um, the coronavirus and the challenges that happened earlier. Why am I why am I thinking this is a hard time in my life when we see the times of the early Christ- the early saints? And Joseph is afflicted with malaria, and he's outside, and um, his house was being used sort of like a hospital area there to gather in the ill people, the sick, and Emma was attending to them, and Joseph was, but he was so sick at this point, and he was laying in bed meditating on, he wished he had um, the faith to heal and to help the saints who were just in, so many were dying of malaria. And he receives the revelation from the Lord that this is time to arise from his sickbed. And even in his weakened state, he does. And he he describes it going past Sidney Rickton's stone house. And then there's tents all around. You know, they don't know that you should stay out of the swamplands and build up on the bluff. And they are... Um, He goes from tent to tent healing, and as the day rolls on, more and more people join him and do the healing as well. And then they take a boat, and they go across over to the Iowa side, and there's healings there. And and it's getting dusk, and Joseph has to go now, and a a man um, who hears about it from an outlying area runs to Joseph and says, can you please, 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 I have little twins. They're three months old, and they're dying. Um, Can you please come? And I just couldn't help but think of how Joseph was reminded that his twins had died uh, prior to this, and he was not able to save his twins. But he's too weak, and so he takes a silk handkerchief from his pocket, and he hands it to the brethren and says, take this with the man and lay it on the children's face, and they will be healed. And that's exactly what happened, and the twins lived. The handwritten account is here if you'd like to see it. Otherwise, you can read it in the history of the church in more details. But this gift of healing was something that Joseph did not get to call upon. But at the dedication of the Kirtland Temple in 1836, he did get to call upon. Um, And the Lord inspired him to tell the saints that if you are prepared, it will be a Pentecostal experience. You will see the Savior. You will have the heavens opened. You will have a witness that this work is rolling forward. And that whole week is just filled with some of the most beautiful spiritual experiences in the history of the church. I'm sensitive to the fact that those things don't happen very often now. I've been to temple dedications, and I've tried to prepare myself so that I would have those kind of experiences, and they didn't come. But the more I've studied them, the more I've realized The nudgings of the Spirit are what the Lord uses to encourage us. And the great and glorious are needed when great changes are needed. And the Lord needed to teach those early saints the difference 
Remember, we are told that we come to earth to learn from our own experience to distinguish good from evil. And these early saints needed to see the difference. They had sort of a Moses experience where Moses just laughed when Satan came because he had seen the Lord. And these people had an outpouring of the Spirit that week between the different dedicatory services and the visitation by Malachi and um, section 110 of the Doctrine and Covenants, which was the second day of uh, Passover, which we'll talk about more in detail when we get to that section of the Doctrine and Covenants. One of Joseph's closest associates was his cousin, George A. Smith. And George A. said, there was no point upon which the prophet Joseph dwelt more than the discerning of spirits. This became one of his, from the Kirtland days forward, one of his favorite topics that was used regularly when he spoke to the saints, that we have got to be careful to make sure we are following our Savior's direction and not the adversary's sign. My time is up, so I'll just skip ahead a little bit to this amazing discovery. I went through all the standard works looking for words that refer to the Spirit or the Holy Ghost or the Comforter, baptism by fire, whisperings of the Spirit. I have a whole slew of them. And I then compared them. And even though the New Testament was called, as we mentioned earlier, the dispensation of the Spirit, the time of the early Christianity, dispensation of the Spirit, and the second half of the New Testament is filled with mentions of the Spirit, even though that is the highest of references to the Spirit when compared to the Book of Mormon and the Old Testament, when we throw the Doctrine and Covenants in the mix, just looking at the sections that Joseph wrote initially, we have an even higher word ratio than there is in the New Testament. 2.2% of the words in comparison to the total refer to the Spirit in Joseph Smith's modern revelations that we now have canonized. This was a great topic that the Lord wants our generation to know. And that's why when Joseph Smith came to talk to Brigham Young when they were in winter quarters, Brigham said, what, what do you want? What should I do, Joseph? What should I tell the saints? And he said, tell them they need to seek the Spirit and learn the language of the Lord. They need to learn and prepare for personal revelation. Of course, those are my words, not the exact text. And then what does our prophet, President Nelson, say? The first session of conference after he is called, I asked the Lord what I should tell you, and I'm telling you, you have got to learn how the Holy Ghost functions, and you have got to rely more strongly. And that's exactly what we see in the Doctrine and Covenants. And that is what Joseph Smith said, the major difference between our church and others to President Martin Van Buren on that November 29th, 1839, when he visited the White House to try to take care of the remunerations from our losses in Missouri. We differ in the mode of baptism and the gift of the Holy Ghost by the laying on of hands. And then he wrote his brother, Hiram, that week in a letter, we considered all other considerations were contained in the gift of the Holy Ghost. So priesthood authority, the power of God, the ordinances, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, are all part of this gift of the Holy Ghost. And I pray that we can have hearts that are soft and pure, that we can repent daily, that we can always remember our Savior so that we can have this gift as a constant companion. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Thank you.